All right, perfect. Uh, well, good Tuesday morning or possibly Wednesday morning, depending on where in the world you at, are at right now. I guess it could also be a Tuesday night for you too, uh, but that's semantics. So uh, my name is Jennifer. Um, we've probably met before. If we have not, lovely to meet you. And today we're hosting a very special office hours with a few guests we'll introduce in just a moment. All right, so let's get down to it. Uh, the following two really need no introduction, but we're going to make one anyway. Uh, so first up is Praveen. Uh, Praveen, if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, and say one or two things since your hobbies are uh, embarrassed silence, that would be great if you could fill that void for, <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> yes, hi, hi everyone, I'm Praveen. Um, and I've been with AppSheet, I guess, from the beginning. So it's great to, um, I may have, must have interacted with many of you in the community and. Happy to be here again today. Excellent. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, and next up is a gentleman by the name of Thierry. Uh, many of you have probably interacted with Thierry uh, before, but Thierry, if you'd like to say a few things about yourself. Yeah, good morning or evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, hopefully I've interacted with quite a few of you in the community and, and hopefully a few more in the future. Uh, I've had the privilege to be with AppSheet for about a year now. Uh, being invited uh, by Praveen to join the company and I'm really thankful uh, to him for that. It's been a, it's been a blessing, it's been a, a, a lot of fun. Uh, my hobby, as said here, it's anything that looks like a hill that can be hiked, I <laughs> usually will try to hike it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I love to chill at HA. Unfortunately, you know, training for mountaineering and eating uh, dual chill at HA don't go very well together. <laughs> Thierry, I have a feeling you've hit some altitudes though yes. um, where Dolce de leche ice cream would, would be okay at that height. Yeah, actually, you would need to try to eat as much as possible to try to stay healthy. <laughs> All good points. All right. Um, so thank you, gentlemen, for those introductions. So let's get into kind of the meat of what we'll be covering today. So uh, our announcement is essentially that today we will be discussing um, product roadmap. Um, where we've been since we've been with Google for almost six months and kind of what the future entails for us. Um, so that's going to be our announcement bucket. This whole hour will cover a lot of that. Um, really, it's what's actually been up to, which is why Praveen and Thierry have taken time to join us today to dive into that a little deeper. Um, we'll go over some of the visible deliveries for you all, cover any q and I know there's a lot of questions you have, and then move on to next steps. So without any further ado, uh, Thierry, I'm going to pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so perfect, uh, perfect move to the to the right side. So, I mean, the the, the reason we we got the idea to to talk with you directly uh, and not just through the community forum is, you know, a couple of of you gave some feedback recently that you know they, it seemed that we had become a bit more obscure and uh, you didn't have a confidence and feeling that we had been as engaged with the community as we had been in the past before. And the tr truth is, we had wanted to, but yeah, maybe we but a bit diverted by some of the things we needed to do uh, as part of that acquisition. So we just wanted to make a session that was going to be kind of a candy talk uh, with you. So I, you know, I put together a couple of slides, mostly as a supporting materials. There's really only three or four slides here. Uh, mostly as a supporting material for for your questions. So please start filling out the questions, and then hopefully we'll spend the majority of the time beyond questions. So just a bit as a recap. January 14th is actually when we became part of Google. Now, what happened, just to give you a bit of the inside scoop, is we really started some of the talk, at least I said to become aware of some of the talk early November. So it was actually quite of a fast acquisition. Uh, when we kind of became serious or when you know, Praveen and Brian became serious about the acquisition in November to the time we closed the deal, uh, that was pretty much December. And uh, for a few folks at Google, mostly Praveen, Brian, and a couple of engineers, there was not a lot of a holiday. It was a super busy holiday so that we could do all the stuff required, all the prerequisite required to be acquired. So we were super, super busy with that. Uh, we definitely had to put a couple of stuff on hold in order to do those prerequisites in the, in the November, December timeframe. So there were a couple of development that were in the progress that we kind of had to halt uh, in order to, to give priorities to that. And then since we joined, uh, you know, we've, we've, there's definitely some things that when you're app sheet and when you're Google are two different things. Uh, the level of expectations of security handling, of privacy, not yet, please, uh, compliance uh, by Google uh, is huge. It's not like we didn't care about those before, we did, but nowhere near the amount and the level that Google expects and that people expect of Google. The other thing too that the Google folks were telling us is the day the, the acquisition is going to be announced, there's going to be a huge amount of people going to try to break you. And they're going to try to be as mean as possible. Whereas before, we didn't have to be worried 
as much about being broken because nobody knew about us as much and or nobody really cared enough about us to try to even break us to the same level of extent and enthusiasm that people will try to break us the day of the acquisition. So we really have to spend a lot of time, you know, uh, making some changes to our code to the way we handle privacy and compliance. That's why when you have when you're interacting with us in support, we now have to ask you to go into a certain place to check some buttons or to check some checkbox so that we have the, actually the right to look at your apps and those kind of things. Uh, and that's definitely per, per per requirement from Google. And and we still have quite a few of those things going on. Uh, so while it might not have a direct value to you in terms of feature capability of the system, I think hopefully in terms of trust level that you can place in our system that will have some good benefit to you. Now, the other thing that happened, which is has been, you know, adding some challenge to us, but that's kind of a blessing in these guys as well, is the team actually has grown. Uh, and like often happens with acquisition where you're being acquired and then you put in a corner to kind of like, you know, prove yourself to a set of people before you kind of like, you know, eventually are given the, the light to, to kind of shine and to, uh, to, 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 to grow inside the company. Uh, as soon as we got acquired, uh, you know, the, the company, the, the sponsors of the acquisition have actually given us a lot of other teams uh, and, and, and people to help us not just address security, privacy, compliance, migrating to GCP, but, you know, really they want to invest in us and they want to invest in the technology and make it a, a big, big solution for, for Google. So we've definitely, you know, we've tripled the size of the company so far, uh, sorry, the size of the team so far. It's a good thing, but it also means there's a lot of learning, a lot of teaching. Uh, you know, we have to teach them our code base. They have to teach us the ways of doing things at Google. So we're investing time and that definitely results in maybe a bit less efficiency for now in terms of focusing on innovation, which might explain some of the, the perceived slowdown. But again, I will look at that as an opportunity too, because that means very, very soon when everybody is up to speed, uh, we have that three times as many people that can work on some of those capabilities as we had before. So. Uh, to me, that that's actually very encouraging and, and very uh, very exciting. And uh, looking at the picture, and then you know, as I was you know mentioning here, we're of course going to be migrating from Azure to GCP. It should be entirely transparent to all of you, except for the fact that uh, we're going to be able to leverage a lot more of the systems and the infrastructure and the scale of GCP that we could with Azure. Not that Azure couldn't scale, but it cost us. Whereas here with GCP, the, the way the cost is, is handled is very differently and nowhere the, the same price point as, as is when we had to commercially pay Azure to host our service. So we're working very aggressively on that. And, and, uh, and while a lot of that will not have direct visibility to you or perceived uh, changes to you because it should be transparent, the day we, we, uh, we tip over the traffic to GCP is the day you probably won't see it, except maybe we'll ask you to open a couple of more IPs. Um, IP addresses and what proxy, you know, what is a couple of IP addresses, and that uh, that will be it. Uh, and that actually is going to come pretty soon. Um, so that's kind of what has been happening behind the scene. Now, if you go to, go to the next slide, uh, Jennifer, that would be great. That doesn't mean we've done nothing. As a matter of fact, and I did the count, uh, we did about 120, uh, uh, you know, uh, features uh, that we did in that time frame. Now, some of them might be relevant to you. Some of them might have been really for one customer in particular that had a scenario that we wanted to enable or whatnot. I picked some of the most common here uh, that we actually released in that three to four months time frame. Now, I'm not trying to justify ourselves here, saying, hey, you know, look, we still some, done some stuff, but we not uh, also also wanted to, to, to bring in here a bit of, of, of the choose too, is we actually haven't stopped. That's actually one of the things that I think has been quite amazing is we've been acquired, we continue to run the service, and not just that we continue to run the service, we continue to deploy daily, and we continue to deploy new capabilities uh, as well and respond. Like many of those here, the device unique ID was a request from, um, from the field, the domain email function was a request from the community. A lot like the price one was a request from the community as well. So many of those that you see here were actually uh, requests from, uh, from, from the community. Uh, right. So we've been continuing uh, to do. Praveen here, if yes. I can jump in with a quick comment. Um, many of these are relatively small features, um, but that was actually also a good way to bring new engineers yes. onto the product. Because when a new engineer joins, you acquaint them with the code, you go over reviews of existing functionality. And then the first thing we would do is say, go work on one small new feature. Somebody's asked for this feature, uh, let's go do it. It's a way to uh, get more familiar with the system, deploy your code. Uh, make sure it runs well and so that's why many of these would be small but a new engineer wrote that feature and so they're ready to do something bigger after that 
Yeah, that's a, that's a super. And gentlemen, oh, I'm sorry, Terry. If, if I okay. may, um, there are three really critical items we've addressed here that I want to summarize quickly for our audience. One is that growing the team has been really critical for ensuring that this product can meet um, the needs of all of you. Um, Terry and Praveen both mentioned different ways this is happening. The the kind of ironic thing about no code platforms is you need people coding in the background for no code to function. Um, so that that's kind of an interesting catch 22. Um, but that takes the lift, as you all know, off of off of your plate. Um, behind you are in Oz right now, and we've we've lifted the curtain for you right now, so you can see what's going on behind the scenes. And then also your input on the community does directly impact what we're building. It may not always seem like it, but we are listening, we are seeing what you're asking for, and we're trying to incorporate that where we can as we advance forward. So keep those in mind as we move forward in this conversation. Yeah, one thing to add to that, to your comment and the one that Praveen was saying, you know, when we're onboarding new engineers, uh, whether they're totally new to Google or they came from Google, but new to the team, we're asking them to do a few things. Take a small, you know, first of all, take a support ticket, one that comes through our, our support system, look at something from the forum and from the community that they could be working on or help answer a question on the community one or two, and then take a small feature. So literally, until they've done all three of those things, at least one of all three of those things, no, I'm not getting it right. Until they've done one support ticket and at least answered one or two forum question and done one small feature, they, they are not being considered on board yet on the, on the, on, on the team. So. That's definitely something we're pushing them to do. In terms of how much we're actually looking at it, we actually haven't changed, I believe. Uh, Praveen and I, and I know many others, are looking at uh, at everything that's coming through uh, through the forum globally. I will guarantee you and tell you, that's been part of my routine, and I know to Praveen as well, to actually look at every single thing that comes through the forum every morning. That's the first thing I do when I get on the system. I check the support, the support ticket, and I read every single entries in those. So we're still looking very much into all of those and trying to figure out which one are the one we can help you with versus let the, the community help you know answer in a, in a kind of a uh, network and, and organic fashion. And then which one can we give to one of our new engineers to help with or to work on? Were you going to say something, Jennifer? Uh, no, no, that's that's oh, great. All right, why don't you move to the next slide? And by the way, again, I know I'm going very one way here. Hopefully that will give you a chance to start feel, feeling the question because this is about my last slide here. Well, maybe I think there's one more. Uh, and really it's to support the, help support the conversation and answer all the questions that, uh, that you may have. So what's in the pipeline? And the pipeline actually uh, is actually the roadmap has not changed uh, in terms of the type of things that we want to want to work on. There's more things that have been added to it to be a better Google citizen, but in terms of where we want to invest to make the product better uh, for uh, citizen developers is as, as we mean the same. We still want to work on the richness of it. We still want to work on authoring uh, elements of the application. We want to continue improving the experience, the user experience of using and experiencing those applications and, and make them more feeling like native Google or Apple type of application. Uh, connectors is definitely an area where we've actually uh, I've got some some changes and some uh, increase of scope due to uh, the acquisition of Google. And then uh, the administration is important, especially if the product is going to be uh, embraced uh, more and more in the company in a more kind of viral way, we really need to give you better ways to actually administrate the, the portfolio of application with no code. So if you click one more, I'll give you one level of detail of some of the things that we're currently uh, working on or think, you know, actually working on pretty much all of those. Um, so, you know, in terms of richness, the workflow is definitely one of the magic, magical points of the platform. That's, that's a very powerful thing because there's a lot of things you, that really workflows allow you to automate. And so we're kind of definitely working on site on, on our overall here to make it definitely a lot more powerful uh, platform here. Uh, and by the way, I'm passing a bunch of enhancements to function that, as you've seen in the previous slide that we've been doing and we're going to continue to be doing uh, that I didn't even detail. This is, by the way, not an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, we're working on iPhone views right now, uh, something that I think is going to give a lot of power of extensibility in terms of what you can actually embed inside of the app and have interacting dashboards. Um, so pretty, pretty excited about that. I personally, a lot of scenarios I'm super pumped to be able to enable thanks to that. Uh, in terms of authoring, fairly soon you're going to see, uh, of course, the, the reskin where the application is going to look much more like a 
Google product, uh, as well as deeper integration with G Sheets and G Drives and, and the companion uh, that, that we're uh, going to be working on actually very, like, very, 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 very soon. Uh, we're also realizing that as we're adding more capabilities to the system, more tasks and more options, we're also making it more complex. Not that any single feature by itself might be very complex, but the combination of them and finding where they are uh, has definitely become a bit more uh, challenging uh, over time. So we, we think there's definitely a lot of value that we can spend by simplifying the identification, but like with everything, to make it feel easy, it takes a lot of work. Uh, a lot of work, not necessarily in terms of a lot of coding, but a lot of thinking about how do we make something that actually feels easier and much more intuitive to everybody. Um, so I talked about the workflow overall, didn't realize I actually duplicated it here. Uh, and then definitely something we want to do is actually, uh, you know, suggestions. We've done suggestions, but very, uh, very granular level suggestions. And we want to really have a, a better way to actually suggest modules, entire application modules based on the industry uh, that you're in or the intent that you have or that you're expressing to us. Um, so yeah. Oh, I guess I put navigation improvement here too. Uh, Trying view overall, that's also something I'm super excited about. Uh, uh, you know, being able to have uh, charting that is a lot easier for you to author and consume. Uh, that's coming up soon. As you can see, we're talking about video. We've been working on that before. We continue to work on that and that hopefully will come up soon. Uh, in terms of connectors, you can see the list here. There's a, there's a lot of things we're working on. The last thing I want to spend a little bit of time here on, on the, is on admin. Uh, like Praveen, you know, uh, is telling us, he says, we want the application to be compiled by default. How do we really build an environment where you can declare the policies you want to be applied to your system and within that coding for us to be able to have declarative policies uh, and, and that, that really make any application being built in your environment uh, compliant to uh, by default to, to what you want to do. And you know, we, we think of the, the level of reporting and insights we're giving you on the application usage and, and user population uh, is nowhere near where it should be. So we are taking advantage of moving a lot of our systems to GCP to be able to hopefully very soon provide you a lot better insights and reporting and IT capabilities on uh, on all of the data uh, of your of your application. Uh, you know, sub teams is something that we know, <clears throat> especially people who have been adopting at a much larger scale, uh, actually do need uh, because you different have different population that have needs to, to have different policies, different permissions, and those kind of things. And SOC2, you know, ISO, uh, IFA, all those compliance is, is definitely something that we know is becoming more and more important for a larger enterprise as well. So that's that's something we're working on. Uh, not so much a lot of engineering work, but a lot of process work and very tedious work that uh, some folks on our team have to do. So anyway, it's kind of a big overview. Anything you want to add, uh, Praveen, that I haven't covered in terms of big stones um, on what's, what's in a pipeline for this year? I know, I think this is a great summary and I would love to the questions our our audience has yeah um, and i've got a few um that have bubbled up that are really relevant for this particular slide and just to recap for everyone these five areas listed these are kind of our buckets that we're looking at working on um, throughout the end of this year and, and early next year as well um, these are all specific features within those buckets that we are looking to improve so i, I just want to make sure everybody's kind of grasped that concept um, one question, uh, Terry and Praveen, that just popped up that I think is really important uh, in the app sheet mission statement period. Um, so we have a customer who works with Microsoft 365. And the question is, uh, we work in Microsoft 365 with data stored in SharePoint. Do your future plans include continued support for this data source? And your answer. Uh, you want to go, Terry? Uh, so Sure, let me just give a first one and then you'll give the better one after. Uh, let's go that way, increasing <laughs> level of, of, of quality. Uh, one of the things that we talked very early on during the, the process of the acquisition was whether Google has an intent to for us to optimize solely on the Google platform. And very early on, it was very clear that the desire and intent of the sponsors, uh, folks who, who promoted the acquisition at Google, was not that, was actually to be a multi-platform a product and continue to be a, 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 a very open platform. So uh, we're not reducing uh, at all the uh, the level of support we have for all of those platforms, which includes the Microsoft platform as well. So that, that's the first level of answer. And then now I will let Praveen give the really great one. <laughs> no, that's actually, that's the important level of the answer is uh, there is zero intent 
uh, we were an open platform connecting to data from whether it was Azure, AWS, Google, you know, uh, SharePoint, OneDrive. We want to consume the data from wherever the customer has it. And uh, that continues. And that's not changed at all. In fact, if you look at the work here under connectors that Thierry's listed on this slide, um, some of the main work we're doing is uh, when we connect to API providers, which is new work we're doing right now, we'll connect through this uh, open standard called Open API. When you connect to data providers, you connect to an open standard called OData. Um, without a doubt, we will continue to connect to various, you know, OneDrive, Office 365, SharePoint sources, because that's where many of our customers have their data. So, uh, yeah, and that will not change. Excellent. And that really speaks to, you know, how we democratize development, right? Having access to all of these different data sources. Yep. All right. Um, so another question, uh, AppScript, what does it mean? And can we use custom GAS within AppSheet? Uh, maybe let me take that. Um, so for those, so many of you are familiar with what AppScript is. It's a sort of scripting language, which is used to automate various parts, various uh, capabilities in the G Suite family. Um, and more broadly in the Google ecosystem. Um, it's not something we particularly supported deeply, um, but what we found after we come, came, became part of Google is that there are many G Suite customers who are building a rich end-to-end -end solution of which app sheet, they want app sheet to be a part of it, but they want this richer, if you wish, a low end code capability. And they already have uh, existing assets, which are these app script scripts. Um, and they had some existing infrastructure that would connect to it. And so the real question was, can AppSheet connect to these app scripts? Um, what we're doing on this front is at the first cut is all we're really saying is from workflow rules and webhooks, you can easily call out to a web hosted app script. Um, and we put, and we have to actually jump through some hoops or an authentication to make this work. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. Just call an app script through a webhook in a workflow rule. Um, but the, it's a little tricky to set that up right and so we're just working through some of that um we will uh, we have no intention of exposing app script as a first class concept with an app sheet and suddenly become a code based system we are not we are no code um <laughs> but we recognize that there's other services that um customers have in their environment that involve various kinds of code and we want to be able to invoke that easily Terry, anything to add there no okay uh, so, Thierry, I, I have a question I'm going to throw your way. I have a feeling you're going to um, have a great response for this. Um, so the question is, can I hear more about charting view overhaul? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, well, the first thing we'll do is we, we'll replace the library we're currently using with one that we think has a lot more capabilities of ability for to, to interpret your intent uh, in a lot easier. But the first step is probably going to be fairly light in terms of how, how you're going to see. We're going to replace the library when it come out. Hopefully, a lot of the labels and and uh, axes uh, and, uh, will just render better. So you will mostly see a slight improvement in rendering, but of course, with the desire to do fully backward compatible, so you don't have to change anything to the authoring or the definition of your chart. It just renders mostly the axis, uh, the axis headers and the labels better, because right now, it's, 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 it's not very good to, to and I'm being gentle here. Um, the second thing we're looking at is replacing all of the charts in the manage pages uh, and in the uh, my apps uh, and my account pages uh, with that library and uh, provide you more built-in reports of your data. Uh, and uh, you know we're also changing the data pipeline that we use underneath it, which we know in some cases has been fragile and has there's been some issues coming through support so we're replacing that pipeline uh that's also something we have to do to be more compliant with google's expectation but that will also give uh us more capabilities in terms of data that we can push to you uh, and then the third phase will be and that's been kind of my hope for since pretty much day when i joined the company was to actually replace the authoring experience which i don't find is nearly very as intuitive as it could be or should be uh, and so we're currently working and we actually have a prototype running that I'm super excited about based on what I saw last week 
that is very promising uh, and to give an authoring experience that would be much more along the line of the card view. Uh, and hopefully where you have a very wheezy wig uh, experience of choosing columns and seeing immediately uh, something that actually makes sense with the right default charts and, and things like that. So the, the, the prototype I've seen uh, last week is actually super exciting and it's going exactly the right direction. Uh, for those who don't know my background, I, I spent six years uh, leading the engineering team at Tableau. And so my dream was always to build something that could come along the line of a Tableau style ex authoring experience. And I'm not saying we're gonna do anything near that because they have about a thousand engineers for 10 years. Uh, but you know, conceptually, we, what, what I'm seeing there is, is very promising. So that's pretty much the extent of what I wanna say. I'm realizing I'm already setting such high expectation that now I'm gonna have, uh, we're gonna have to deliver uh, big on this one, but, uh, but just, uh, just hear me say when I say that, I'm super excited about it. Excellent. Praveen, anything to add to Thierry's remarks? Actually, I don't think he's seen the prototype, so ah. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he's curious now. He's like, I want to see oh, it. I want to see it, yes. <laughs> exactly. We're, we're, we're really going behind the curtain here. Thierry, no pressure on you at all <laughs> right now. Um, I, all right, so I've got... Uh, we, we have a lot of really great questions coming in right now. I'm going to do a quick um, operational correction here. If you have questions, please try to post them on the link to the community thread where they're split kind of right now. But the great thing is if you post them in the forum, anything we don't get to here, you'll be able to, we'll be able to follow up with visibly on our community forum. Um, or they can, we can receive a crowdsourced answer there for you too. So we wanna make sure that we're able to answer as many of these as possible. Um, so just a quick shout out there. And speaking of the community, um, actually let's, let's talk about iframes for a moment. Um, so one, we have a question just on in general what an iframe is. And the second question is in an iframe view, would we expect scripts to execute within the iframe? Uh, example, client side JavaScript. Who would so like let's, to start? Yeah, I'll start with the high level and then uh, if Praveen wants to complete on some of the more security related question, which is really around the, the, the being able to run a script. Um, so an iframe is mostly being able to, to load a web view on a, on a view in your dashboards. And of course, you know, the next question is you don't want that web view to be kind of dead, but dead and you want it to interact with the other elements of your dashboard so that if you select a row, you want to be able to pass as an argument uh, the ID of any of the column values from that row into as an argument to that URL uh, on that web view. So here's, you know, my, my own scenario has been, I've always wanted to have a Tableau view because again, I wasn't satisfied with the charting capabilities of, of AppSheet as it is today. It was not sufficiently good enough for some of the views I wanted to build. That I wanted to be able to embed Tableau in there and be able to pass as an argument, the value of the current rows I was looking at. So that's literally, Example, there's been other people who've been asking on the forum, actually on the community, about being able to load a detailed map routes, for example, from systems that they have, from you know, geospatial systems that they have. And you will want to pass the driver or the truck, you know, ID or or, 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 or you know, unique you know, code to that uh, geospatial mapping kind of a software. So be able to kind of map the route of that driver or of that truck. So these are the type of scenarios. Uh, and, and the nice thing about it is you can theoretically load any web view. And so long as you can pass an argument, you can build some really, really nice dashboards with some nice visuals in there that are, you know, that are years ahead of what we could ever build in or even maybe intend to build in uh, as part of, of AppSheet because we're not a geospatial software. We're not, you know, specific. We're not specializing in many of those industries type of visuals or, 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 or application. And yet sometimes you just want them to work together and you want your AppSheet dashboard to be the home page for all of your uh, workflows. And then you won't be able to pull in views from other systems uh, in, in, in context. So that's the high level. In terms of being able to pass scripts, there's some security implication. Uh, Praveen, do you want to talk about those? Yeah. Uh, posting iframes inside another web application is tricky business. And there's a bunch of exploits and uh, edge cases that show up. Um, so it turns out many sites first refuse to allow their web page to be iframed inside something else. So that's sort of one on one side. And conversely, for example, most app sheet pages cannot be iframed inside something. The only ones we allow are the whole 
the uh, page that runs a whole app. But if you try to iframe my editor or something, it won't work. Um, the flip side of it is um, when we uh, decide to allow somebody else to iframe something uh, inside AppSheet, there's a bunch of exploits that are possible that can trick a user into thinking there's somebody else and vice versa. So there's a bunch of things that, especially at Google, there's a lot of experience with this and there's a lot of um, security reviews you have to go through to make that happen. Um, so for starters, we're going to provide a very restrictive version of iframes. So it will not have the JavaScript and what it'll just be content and you can show the content and we'll start there and ease very slowly to providing more capabilities. Um, so it'll handle some useful cases. For example, if you've got HTML content that you need to show, um, you can show it in an iframe, but running entire applications with, you know, all the richness that they have, JavaScript, take forms, capture things, keep cookies, um, that comes with just a, a immense burden. You're sort of way better off trying to launch that in an external uh, page where your browser gives you all the security and isolation. Um, so that's at least, you know, we're easing into it, but we're not diving in head first. All right. Um, you all have so many great questions. Let's go to, uh, all right, next up is on geolocations. Uh, will you support data residency and geolocation compliance requirements? For example, processing of data from Canada data sources in Google Cloud data centers in Canada. So uh, let, let me start here. And, and again, Praveen, you can compliment me here. The, the, one of the beauty of now being part of Google is, you know, as we're moving our infrastructure to GCP, uh, it will become a lot easier for us to be able to replicate our hosting of data in many more locations that would have been when we're just paying Azure for, for it. And of course, every region and replication of data has a pretty significant cost for a small startup. So uh, that at least takes some of the, those friction points away in terms of having the infrastructure where we know we have the now GCP host data centers in all the countries or all the major countries. Uh, and uh, and we technically and potentially have the ability to host it. Now, there's definitely some improvement we need to make to our infrastructure to be able to replicate uh, the data in, in multiple, in, in many locations. So we haven't yet determined where, uh, where we're gonna do all of those right now, as, as I think most people know, we have three regions, uh, which is um, uh, US West, East and Europe West, uh, with definitely the intent to go much beyond that. Uh, but we haven't established exactly the plan and the, and the time frame in which we're gonna go in which places. But technically now, well, that road is open to us. Do you want to add more to that, Praveen? Yeah. Um, so in an AppSheet system, um, there's uh, the servers that actually are the ones that run, when, when your app runs, the servers are the ones that are fetching the data from wherever your data is, and it flows through our servers that run in the cloud and are sent to your devices or browsers. Um, that data, you know, let's say your data started out in SharePoint or uh, AWS or Google, doesn't matter. The servers don't store the data, right? The data lives with your, wherever your store is, it flows through our servers to your devices. Um, so those, those servers don't have state and persistence of your data. Um, currently, uh, users who are in uh, Europe um, get routed to servers that are in Europe. Um, by default, based on the uh, location of the IP address, and that's something we have set up, and it was it's related to regulation in Europe, and um, that's something that we uh, probably will do more of because there are, for example, last week I was in a conversation with a customer who said, "Hey, we're based in the U.S. and we want our data to flow through uh, servers in the U.S." And that's based on IP address. That's pretty straightforward to do. There's another. Um, aspect of our system which is uh, almost like a metadata database that's a database that says here are the users um here are their apps and so on right so that's basically our data about the accounts and the users that's all currently in a single sql server database all right it's a single uh, relational database um that is not distributed across in different locations and um uh, conceptually, just from a technology point of view, it can be broken into different unique pieces that are normally, at a technical level, you call them shards or like fragments, if you wish, and put in different spots. It makes our uh, code 
more complicated because when a person comes in and wants to run an app, we have to figure out, hey, which of these different locations should it be in so we can go fetch it from there? Um, and that's something we have to retrofit into our system. Actually, uh, a couple of us have been working on um, a prototype of that and which was sort of working a couple of weeks ago, but that's maybe a long way away from deploying it. So it's a sort of more detailed answer. Um, uh, we will move in this direction of serving, uh, providing our service in a sort of geo-aligned um, fashion, but the steps are not, not completely clear yet. All right, thank you both for those answers. Uh, all right, so there, there's a, a rather large bucket of questions, if you will, um, and they're related to specific Google features like Gmail, Docs, Sheets, a lot of them have to do with workflows. Um, can you, either of you provide any clarity or insight in terms of how we might be working with particular Google features in the near future? Um, a lot of that is actually being defined right now. So I, I, I wouldn't be able to give you a lot of details, not to say we don't have some of them yet, but it's still somewhat fluid in terms of which ones were still in negotiation with some of those teams too, because now that we work with those partner teams, we have to make sure that whatever integration points we build with those team is agreed upon, they can do their part of the at their end of the of the bargain and we do ours. And so uh, it's unfortunately, I would say a bit too premature for us to give you more detail about that yet. It's definitely being actively worked on, or has been actually worked on for the last couple of months already. Uh, in terms of what and how and 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 getting commitment from those uh, par partner teams, uh, but I I wouldn't feel comfortable giving you a lot more detail. Maybe Pravin does. <laughs> no, Jennifer, <laughs> actually, could you? Uh, I wasn't sure I completely caught the question. Is it that were specific other Google features, or were they sort of more of a generic question? So uh, I have about three dozen questions right now asking oh. about various Google features that will uh, be compatible oh. with, whether it's a Gmail integration or um, there's one really interesting one about um, having Google Docs or Google Sheets be a workflow based on AppSheet. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so le le let me just do a sort of how we, just a framing of how we think about this. We have always, um, decided on features in one of two ways. Um, one was the, the primary way was based on customer feedback. At various times we have tried to sort of say, hey, is it customer feedback where we do in the very early days? And many of you were, may not have been around for this, but a few may have been. Um, we used to do a poll. We'd get some feedback. We'd say, okay, it sounds like there's two or three things people are asking about. We'd do a poll on a Friday and we'd say, well, there's feature A, feature B, and feature C. Which one does who want the most? And whichever one was chosen the most would be what we worked on next. And we tried to do that feature within a week. That was the early days when things were simple, right? Code was simple, <laughs> we were very... Um, so we started there and we found, you know, voting was sort of one way to do it. Um, then we tried to, uh, we also did the other thing, which is sometimes people were very engaged and they would give us a ton of feedback. And people were very engaged, gave us a ton of feedback. We learned a tremendous amount from them. And so we were sort of, we said, look, uh, when a person who's so engaged with us asks for something, we actually need to try and do it for them. As long as it's something that we would do anyway. Maybe we'd have done it a year later, but let's do it now. Um, because uh, that person's investing and betting on us so much, we need to bet on them and make sure that they move forward. So we've done that bunch of that too. Um, but in all of these, we only did things that seemed to make sense for our broad roadmap. So we had some broad roadmap kind of things. We said, well, no code. If people ask us to go, I want to stick in my own code to do stuff, we're going to very respectfully say, no, that's just not on our roadmap. You're never going to do that. So those sort of broad principles still hold, as in the primary reason we're doing things is going to be because it fits roughly in the roadmap. But then all of the details are coming from because we're learning it from you. Because you're telling us you're trying to do something and you're stuck, you need this extra capability. And that's how we learn that those things matter more than other things. Um, as part of Google, yes, there is some amount of aligned to provide a, a deeper, better experience that's a Google whole experience. So we'll do some of that, but not an insane amount of it. We're still only gonna do the things there which are alignment because a sufficient number of our app sheet customers or potential customers are going to find that valuable. Um, so that's how we basically will still find time to do and we will do 
uh, stuff to integrate with uh, SharePoint, as you brought up, because a lot of our customers have SharePoint. And if more customers value the SharePoint thing versus some integration with a Google feature that's a fringe feature, the SharePoint thing will take priority because it's sort of prioritized around you. Okay. Thierry, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? No. No. And I think this is actually, um, Praveen, thank you almost for that um, unofficial setup. This is a good way to kind of open up a broader conversation on a few questions that we receive um, pretty often or, or statements, if you will. Uh, so part of the reason, and Thierry mentioned this earlier, we wanted to have this session is we realize there's been a little bit of a disconnect in terms of how many of you feel uh, feature requests that you're making are being received, as well as how we're communicating features that are being released out to you. In terms of how features are being received, um, it's really important to know, and both Thierry and Praveen have mentioned this previously, every single one of us on our team checks that community every single day. I know that I personally spend quite a bit of time on there. I've had a chance to interact with many of you, uh, on not only on our forum space, but also across YouTube, in various webinars, things like that. We have a very broad way in which we collect information and feedback from you all, um, especially when it comes to feature requests. We know that um, sometimes something goes out into the universe and it just kind of sits there or you feel like it's sitting there. We do have eyes that, that see um, what you're posting and that does impact our roadmap. It might not be immediate, as Praveen said, it might be a year or so, but we do take that into consideration um, when we're defining features for the future. The second piece of this is how we communicate out uh, features that we've built. This is something that is a consistent work in progress. Um, again, I can speak for myself on this. This is something that I'm working really hard to try to remedy. And part of that is because if we tell you all that a feature is coming out on a specific day and we hit a bug or an issue, and Thierry and Praveen, please feel free to uh, add a comment here if you would like, um, and that feature can't be released on that day, we realize that that could have a significant impact on what you're trying to build. So we're trying to come up with solutions that allow us to be agile in terms of how we're promoting or discussing specific features. I realize that's not a perfect solution for each and every one of you that needs this benefit, but um, a few things that we're going to try to experiment with is one, on the community forum, um, I want to open up a channel that is exclusively feature release notes. It will happen after the feature is released, but it will be a concentrated effort that will only discuss features. Right now, when we release something, it goes in the announcement section and it can often be lost. So we're going to provide some clarity around the feature specific notes there. Um, you should see that go up in the next few days. The second piece is how um, we more broadly communicate our feature releases, which is at the end of every month, there will be a summary post on our blog that will have a list of every feature that came out, just to make sure that if we missed anything in our, our previous communications, um, that you know that it's been released. Uh, Praveen and Thierry, anything to add there? Um, yeah, do you mind actually maybe, it's a good time maybe to go to the next slide, which is the last one, by the way. Yeah. Uh, where well, I was kind of waiting for those type of questions to tee up. So, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll let people really detroit really self-explanatory, but, but the important part is the feature request uh, part of the, the, the community is definitely one that's a big, big uh, funnel of input from us. And some of that gets also fueled through uh, scenarios that we hear through the sales consultants, which again, come from customers and their customers interaction. And then you tell you, we, you tend to have a better understanding of the more complete scenario that we can grasp through the AppSheet community, but th these are very two important uh, scenarios for us to hear. The challenge, of course, that I know you've shared with us and that we've always had is how much do we communicate back or at least, you know, acknowledge that we've heard you uh, other than just, you know, repeating how uh, we are actually looking and reading at it every day. Of course, if we don't answer a specific, you know, feature request thread, or if nobody from AppSheet responds or engage in it, how do you know that we actually have seen it? And how confident are you that we're taking it into account? Uh, and that's, that's a very fair, very fair, fair feedback. And, but as Jennifer was saying, and I've been in the software industry as has Praveen for like 20, 25 years, it's always been a debate because if we engage in every one of those, first of all, we kind of uh, a bit suck away the opportunity for some time the community to help each other. But sometimes a feature request is actually solved by ways that you can support in the system today. So somebody can tell you, no, you actually can do it. You just do it differently, but you can do it. So there's, it's an important sometimes to, to definitely first get some space for the community to help each other. 
uh, then, you know, of course, the thing is, if we answer by saying, we can answer by saying, yeah, we've heard you, but then we don't tell you what we're going to do about it. That's frustrating too. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, if we say, well, we heard you, but, and we're going to do it, and we don't give you a time frame, of course, the first question you're going to be is when, 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 when. And then if we give you a time frame, as Jennifer was saying, and then things change because, again, many things can happen in, in the software, which is, you know, bad, but sometimes there's, there's other, other, other things that happens. There's something critical that we need to get our attention. And that's kind of what happened in, in November. We had to focus very quickly on a lot of energy on getting you know, all the pre work for the acquisition that kind of took a bit of the win out of some big features we were working on. So there's a chance of giving you an expectation that then we can promise on. And again, we end up losing your trust. Uh, if we do that so it's 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 always been a challenge and you know the uh, last thing i will say about that if we become very articulate about what's in you know, our vision what we want to do all of those features and we get very specific about what we're going to do or we're not we're also giving actually a lot of information to all of our competition about what our plans are and so it's trying to find the strike the right balance here of acknowledging building that confidence that you know we're hearing your requests and problem and we're integrating them it's not the only you know, channel of input for us. You know, we also want to make sure we continue to follow our vision and sometimes build the things you have not yet asked, but that we are confident based on all the right. customers' conversation we've had, you're going to want to have. And once we've built it, uh, even though there hasn't been a specific request for it yet, and also taking some strategic investment, like, you know, deeper G Suite integration or return sheet and those kind of things. So it's kind of always a mix between all of those things. And that's kind of the art of building a product roadmap. There's, there's really just no magic formula that there's a bit of an art sometimes of making some trade-off and choices between those and also trying to figure out the right balance of of level of engagement so that you have that face that we are hearing you when we're not always being very specific of telling you exactly what we're going to do about it uh, and i do realize that my answer might not please everybody here on the audience uh, and, and 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 some of you might feel that it's a very frustrating answer but I'll tell you candidly, that's that's really what the, the thinking we're going through. And Jennifer and Peter and, and Pravin and I, we've had, and Santiago, we've had many of those conversations about how do we provide that in feedback to the community and how much can we do it in a way that, that's respectful and potentially doesn't break your trust. Great. Uh, Praveen, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, there's a couple of comments in the uh, community thread that I'll just sort of uh, read out at least part of one by Francois Montaigne, which is, um, in the past, I posted in the community a few times about bugs. I found in feature ideas, spending hours to document the cases, but never got official feedback from AppSheet. Um, in 2017, I read a blog post by Praveen where he says, our customers are our team. So I remain positive about the future. But, you know, Francois says, hey, are you really functioning like that uh, anymore? And there's a follow-up from Stephen Ong saying, you're right. Took him Sometimes I post feature requests, blah, 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 but never get a response from Apache. Another thing I've noticed is the support. It becomes more generic support. If I post a few issues, the first response is we do not support this or that uh, to make the issue go away. I had to push further to get my point across. I hope that's not the future trend. So the first thing I want to call out is I uh, hear it and I acknowledge it. I mean, we acknowledge it. Um, what you're seeing is I would say... Um, Growing pains, and uh, if you wish, different cultures that are, um, uh, there's a sort of a culture merge going on. Um, again, if I go back a few years, uh, I was a CEO of a small company. Um, I would directly answer every customer question, or most of them. I'd spend the entirety of Saturday and Sunday on the community and support. Um, and many customers had my personal phone number. Right. So uh, there's sort of a level of direct connection um, and uh, that is tough to scale to uh, 50, you know, team 50 people plus. Um, at Google, uh, as uh, Terry mentioned, the size of the team has tripled and uh, we are trying to basically merge cultures in where all the people joining in, you want to basically say this is still a startup. Now, Terry's pointed out a bunch of the constraints that come with, now you're part of a big company and you cannot just basically, you know, it used to be I could tell any customer, yeah, we're gonna do this for you. Um, and there was a small enough number of customers that the answer is you could just make it happen, all right? Um, we can't quite do that the same way. You have to just get more structured about it uh, and so on. So there's that. I'll say on the flip side, uh, we meet as a team, broad team once in two weeks. Um, 
and in those every two weeks we handed an award to one cust one team member um, exclusively and it's the it's the most we had we started with just one award and it's an award for the team member who has done the most to support customers right either in the community or in a support channel or both and we hand out this award every single meeting and we re-emphasize and underscore how important it is that customers are our team part of our team and we try to re-emphasize that and reinforce it now across a much broader group of people who come from different backgrounds yes there's actually a first level support team now so again different products have different approaches to support uh, my belief is the purpose if a customer is asking us for support we already failed them because the answer is not obvious and we need to short circuit the time they have to wait to get to solving their problems so they can move forward right um and sometimes yes you know uh, sometimes a support for a person who's new to the product might say hey we don't support this um and we're just sort of working with them they're really well intentioned working with them to know so they learn when should they bring things to terry's attention or jennifer's or mine and so on because um the sooner that happens the sooner the customer gets their problem solved so it's a work in progress i just wanted to not uh i wanted to acknowledge what steven and francois and others have uh feel mm -hmm. because it's true um but it's not something we're happy with and we hope that's not the future trend but it's something we will change Thank you both for your candid feedback there. Uh, we have just a few moments left, so I'll, I'll try to address a, a few specific questions here, um, both from an education standpoint and in terms of uh, specific features. So one uh, question that came up is about um, webinar offerings. There's a, a few questions around advanced webinars. So um, for, for full disclosure, we had actually wanted to start running an advanced webinar um, once a month. Um, we know that the introduction office hours, which is what's happening now, typically tends to be more on the fundamentals and announcement piece. We had to postpone this month for a number of reasons, but next month that will be picking up. So do know there is an advanced webinar session that will be coming. Again, we source what we feature in these sessions based on feedback from all of you. So there's been a lot of questions around advanced expressions, for example, that's something that we'll probably cover in the next one, but do let us know what you're interested in and that will help drive the conversation forward. Um, the next question is more roadmap and feature specific and uh, Thierry and Praveen, please let me know if, if you'd like me to go back a slide, um, but it's related to SVG, which is a very popular topic in our communities, as you both know. Uh, and the question is, any plans for more legitimized SVG integration? Uh, I know we've talked about it. Uh, I think we were actually pretty much in the, in the in the deep of talking about that about the time when the acquisition hit. So I think we've lost a bit of focus on that to be fairly candid on this. Um, so yeah, what, what else would you want to add to that, Praveen? Yeah, I think uh, Morgan, who's one of our, you know, actually, uh, people who drives ideas around the uh, app UX, um, has been looking at this for a while. I just don't have an, uh, any any concrete update on it. Yeah, I don't. I feel kind of bad about that, actually. So why don't we actually take an action attempt to get back to the community uh, with a better answer here? Excellent. Thank you both for that. Um, okay, let me... Ooh, questions keep coming. Ah, so um, UX views is another very, very popular topic in the community, as you both know. Um, we have a question on hierarchical, hierarchical views. Um, any plans to incorporate those into what we're building with AppSheet? Yeah, so hierarchical views, Gantt charts. You know, there's a bunch of views that uh, that we've collected that we would like to build uh, build uh, eventually. Right now, really, our focus is really improving the general usability and look and feel of the app itself uh, all of that you shouldn't have too much to do really because it should just happen uh, by, by itself we uh so we're really definitely focusing on on really uplifting the uh the the, the look and feel and the experience uh of, of of consuming the views that are being built in terms of add, adding more richness on their views themselves we're definitely focusing right now on the chart one because the, the, those were uh, very painful and i think uh, prohibiting a lot of people for using them more um and then yeah so article views has definitely something i know even with morgan we've had conversation recently about that about how do we gather the notion of that information of hierarchies in a way that we can then you know translate uh, into the views. so 
I don't have any specifics to give you in terms of timeline and time frame. Uh, it's definitely been in uh, some of our more more recent conversation uh, as it popped up uh, on the on the community. Anything uh, you want to uh, add to that, Praveen? Uh, yeah. A little more color on this. Um, in different parts, you know, the the system has different components, right? And this is a pattern that we go through different components. Um, you build a you build this area. Let's say whether it's the app you are you know the UI for the app or let's say it's some backend thing or workflows. Um, you build it. You get started. You start working on it for a while. The, the requests and the features keep expanding, expanding, and then you reach this moment where you say, "Oh, I have to go re-architect this thing because it's no longer it's the way it was set up. No longer sort of is going to serve the next set of needs." Um, and at that point, you have to retrench some, and what your customers will find is no new features come out for a while because you're in the middle of sort of retrenching and re rearchitecting the the way it was the code is structured. So then now you can do a lot more. Um, and typically for something like that, you need at least two three engineers there because there's some incremental bug fixing, all that stuff has to happen while those couple of other engineers have the time freed up to go rearchitect things. When mm -hmm. you're a team of like you know just ten engineers total, it's kind of where we were before. Um, ultra difficult to do. Um, so now we're sort of much more confident about being able to do some of those things. And the UX view infrastructure is one of those areas where some amount of restructuring needs to happen um, for us to be able to go suddenly now provide 20 kinds of views. We have, we're sort of stretching a bit to provide a kind of maybe eight to 10 kinds of views that we have right now. It's a little clunky to add each new kind of view. Takes too much work. We know we need to re-architect it some in the process of doing some of that. So that explains why we sort of people have asked, why don't you have a structured search view? You promised you know, to have it a while ago. Um, partly is because we couldn't quite get the code re-architected so that we could do that cleanly. You could sort of jam it in in a dirty way, but um, yeah. All right. Uh, well, gentlemen, with just a few moments left, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up. We just did some Q and A. And you know we'll we'll go to the end here. Um, so I want to really quickly thank both you, um, Thierry and Praveen, for joining us today and providing some transparency into what we've been doing and where we're going and spending so much time answering questions of our customers. Um, to all of you out there who attended today, um, do know that this will be posted in the community forum, just like we do with all of our previous office hours. Um, a couple of, of key takeaways that I would like to offer up, and then Thierry and Praveen, if you both have anything to add, please do. Um, one, we want you all to know that we do see you, we do hear you. It may not always seem like it, but we are behind the scenes supporting you in whatever way we can, and we're always working to improve that. Um, if you ever have questions, please feel free to reach out to us directly. The community forum has a feature in which you can send a direct message. So feel free to do that if you're not getting an answer that you want or if you're not comfortable posting something publicly. Um, I know all, the, all of us are very, very active in that space. Um, the other thing I would say is a few of the comments have stated, you know, AppSheet didn't respond. And in some cases, we absolutely should and we're dropping the ball there. But you also all have, a lot of you have the knowledge and the tools to be able to uh, troubleshoot and solve some of these questions um, or problems that you're trying to solve on your own. That's the beautiful thing about democratization of technology is that we've given you the power to be able to find a resolution. So do try to help support each other. That's what the community space is for, to help you get through these issues that you're encountering, whether it's oh, I don't know how to build this, or oh, I, I might be in need of this feature, you know, go search the feature request column. A lot of times feature requests tend to be redundant because we're not leveraging the power of each other. So do know that not just our team is there to support you, but tens of thousands of other app creators are there to support you as well. Um, Thierry and Praveen, anything you'd like to, to close with? Uh, I want to thank you know the the, the you uh, on the call and the community for your level of engagement. I want to thank you for being candid with us and you know calling us Absolutely. out when you feel we're not hearing you because that's actually what triggered for us to say, hey, we need to really talk to you directly, and that's why we're having this session today because you know some of you called us on the forum saying, hey, where are they? We're not hearing them. We're not seeing much innovation anymore. At least that was a perception of it. Uh, and and you know hopefully that was a proof that we're hearing you and we're listening and we're and we're seeing you is that that made us react that made us realize that we've been so focused on helping you know integrate those cultures those teams and kind of continue to to enhance the service that 
maybe we were not as uh, communicating as openly and transparently and as frequently with you as we as we used to, and that was on, that was our fault. So, so thank you for being candid with us and and uh, calling us out when when this needs to when we need to be called out uh, to 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 react and to and to respond to you better. I second uh, that. And and for my part, I'd say we are, yeah, we do this kind of forum, but uh, we absolutely continue to be accessible directly. Um, you can you always be able to please do connect with me directly on the community. You can always send me something and add me to any thread. Uh, you can also send email, and um, I respond to any email any customer sends me. Uh, Praveen at appsheet.com still works. There's a google.com address too, but Praveen at appsheet works great. Um, and um, you know, we I learn a tremendous amount from every interaction with every customer, and that learning then just gets fed into how we can make the product better for you. So um, please don't feel that you are constrained in how you can communicate with us. Um, and as Terry said, I appreciate it, particularly when a customer quote unquote complains uh, because it means they really care about the product and want it to be better. And that's how we learn. Excellent. Well, thank you both again for joining us today. Thank you all for, again, your questions and always being engaged with what AppSheet is doing. We greatly appreciate you all. And stay safe out there, stay healthy, and have a great rest of your day.